Hey y'all, hope you enjoyed the video and it looks like it based on the questions, so let's get right through these. What inspired you to start your job? So I actually used to not work with animals, uh, I actually uh, was following my dad into optometry or being an eye doctor, but I really didn't enjoy being inside, I didn't like that part of science, I really liked being outside and working with animals. Um, so I decided to leave that career and go work at the zoo, and I was put in the research department there, and I really, uh, I really fell in love with it. I really loved working with the animals, finding out new things, especially that research part, where uh, one of the first days that I was there, I was asking what one of the one of the salamanders, uh, which are little like amphibian things similar to lizards, if you're not sure, um, I asked what they eat because I was going to be the one feeding them. And my boss says, "We don't know what they eat. No one's ever had them before, so we don't know. That's kind of your job." And it was really exciting to be like, "Wow, that's a pretty basic thing about an animal that I get to discover something completely new." And it was really exciting. Uh, so that really got me in love with research and animals and stuff. And then this job specifically, I just sent out animal behavior and conservation applications all around the world and this is the one that seemed the most attractive to me in terms of where it is, what the project is, uh, um, all those sorts of opportunities. How is the plant gorse in Otero, New Zealand if it's from Great Britain? So I talked about that a little bit in the other video. Um, Otero, New Zealand was colonized by the British. A lot of British came over here and they brought a lot of things with them. A lot of very bad things, particularly in the wildlife. Like they brought rats and stoats and ferrets and cats and mice and dogs and lots of animals that are doing a lot of damage to the native wildlife here because they weren't used to predators. They aren't used to having to defend themselves. There were no mammals here. There were very few predators at all. And it's kind of the same situation with plants. It's just not always as obvious because plants don't move. So you don't say like, oh, that plant ate the other one. Instead, they just outcompete each other. And that's what gorse does. It comes into a habitat uh, and it just outcompetes other plants here. So it spreads pretty quickly. Uh, in Piha, where I showed you that, it doesn't seem to have taken over yet, but there's been a few islands I've been on that are just completely covered in gorse. Why is the water brown in Corpus and nice and blue in Piha? So in Corpus, the bottom of the water is really sandy and it's really shallow. It doesn't move around very much. So that's kind of the worst possible combination to make it brown and murky. And actually, this happened before y'all were born probably, but Packery Channel, once that was opened up, it really improved the water quality in Corpus. It used to be way, way nastier. Um, but yeah, so it's shallow and it's sandy and it doesn't really get flushed out a lot. So it just kind of moves around as a soup and the sand gets stuck in the water and you can see down to the bottom and stuff. Whereas here, the bottom is rocky, it's much deeper, and it's ocean water. Uh, so it's getting a lot more flow. We're getting water constantly swept alongside the coast and it isn't picking up as much sand because it's rocky at the bottom. And then where there is sand, it's iron sand, which is a lot heavier and just sinks to the bottom immediately instead of just kind of floating in the water. How long have you been studying there? So we've been working on this project for ooh, just a bit over a year now. Um, but I only just arrived here to start doing the field work and all that sort of stuff in August, so that's about six months now. What should the water taste like if it's not salty, and do the sharks make the water salty? So that was actually a joke. Uh, I'm not sure if y'all got that. Uh, the point of that was every single body of salt water in the world has sharks in it. But you shouldn't be concerned about that. Shark attacks are extremely, extremely rare. Um, if you see a shark in the water, or if you're, you're cut, you're bleeding, something like that, uh, you should probably get out of the water. It, it's better just not to take the risk. But shark attacks are extremely, extremely rare, and that was the point I was trying to make. It was a joke I actually heard from a first aid instructor that got a bit frustrated that people kept asking, "Is there sh are there sharks at this beach? Are there sharks at this beach? And she was just like, there's sharks everywhere. If you go and taste the water and it's salty, meaning it's salt water, it's like ocean water, there's going to be sharks there. Um, so yeah, a bit of a joke, but a very real statement about all salt water in the world has sharks in it. How many shark attacks have there been in New Zealand? Uh, very few. Shark attacks are extremely rare. So in the last 10 years, there have only been eight attacks, one of which was fatal, which, as awful as those are, eight attacks in 10 years is not very many, and three of those were while they were spearfishing, so there was blood in the water. Um, so really it's five unprovoked attacks in 10 years across a country that has a lot of people in the water at any given moment, a lot of um, fishing and surfing and boating and swimming and all that. It's an island nation, so people are constantly in the water. So you have a lot of people in the water around a lot of sharks and only had five unprovoked attacks in 10 years. And this is one of the shark attack hotspots of the world. There are places that have way more people in the water, way more sharks, and there's just no attacks. Um, shark attacks aren't something to worry about. That wasn't what I was saying with that joke. Do the Corora little blue penguins swim a lot? Yeah, they swim all day. That's what they do. They live in the water. Uh, they only come on land to breed, so that's only about five, six months a year that they're on land at all. Like, the other six, seven months they're in the water 100% of the time. They sleep and eat and everything out in the water. Uh, and then during breeding season, they only come on land during the day. Um, so the rest of the time they're 
out in the water foraging or hunting. Can you hold the penguins? So we want to avoid bothering them as much as possible. We only handle them when we have to, like when we're getting feathers or blood or taking body measurements or those sorts of things. But yeah, I can. Uh, I have a permit from the Department of Conservation down here that allows me to handle them, uh, take blood and feathers and put GPS trackers and those sorts of things on them. People aren't supposed to touch them unless they have a scientific reason. Uh, just recently, two people stole penguins right out of a burrow. Uh, and that is a crime if, and hopefully when they're caught, they'll be going to jail for two years and fined up to $100,000. How long do the little blue penguins live? So this has never been studied in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It has been studied in Australia with related penguins. They aren't the same species, or at least many people don't think they're the same species. Uh, but you can probably make some good assumptions that if the Australian one does something, the Aotearoa New Zealand one probably also does. So ones over in Australia live on average about seven and a half years, but the oldest one ever recorded was 29 years. So there is a penguin older than me. Where can you find the blue penguins? Absolutely every stretch of beach across the entire country of Aotearoa New Zealand, as well as the Chatham Islands and debatably Australia. And I say debatably because again, some people think they're the same species, some people don't. I lean on the side of them not being the same species. But yeah, absolutely every stretch of beach and water across the entire country. The most common colonies are on islands because humans introduced a lot of predators to the mainland. So if you go onto islands, it's pretty common to see their, their tracks and poo and burrows everywhere. Why are the little blue penguins blue? So that's one of those things that it's kind of, they just are. There are some reasonable thoughts as to why they would be. And the main one is uh, camouflage, just so they blend in with the water better. But there's not like, it's kind of hard to establish there is this reason, like they didn't choose to be blue and it probably was only minor help. So that's one of those things that if we like go around and paint a bunch of penguins to be a different color and they all get eaten because they no longer have that camouflage, we've just gotten a bunch of penguins killed. So it's one of those things you can't really experiment with too easily. You have to compare it to other species. So the thought is penguins have white bellies. So anything looking at them from below, they would be able to blend in with the sky, with the bright sky. And then anything looking at them from above would be looking down into the water and they would have a dark color. So other penguins are mostly black. So they'll blend in with the blackness of the water and the Kuroda, the little blue penguins, uh, they would be blue, or a very dark blue though, and would blend in with the dark water. Are the blue penguins endangered? Um, so the species split thing again, uh, this is something that I'm frustrated with every single day having to deal with the species thing with Australia and Oteiro New Zealand. So there's about half a million of them in the world if you count Australia and Oteiro New Zealand. But if you only count Oteiro New Zealand, it's 65,000, which is getting close to the point where they would call something endangered. So they're not called endangered, but if that species gets officially split up, then they would very likely be considered endangered. And then just nationally, they're considered a threatened species because they're in decline. So it's not about the just the number, how many are there? It's also how many are there compared to how many there were in the past and are there risks to them? And there's lots of risks to them. Dogs, cats, cars, overfishing, habitat loss, rats, those sorts of things. So they're considered at risk and in decline, but not fully endangered. And their main protection is actually the treaty between some of the Māori tribes, the, uh, the native tribes of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Whenever they were having their treaties with the British government, they got to put forward certain demands. We'd like this area protected, we'd like to have this certain right, uh, we'd like to keep this land, those sorts of things. And the Naipahu iwi said, we want all these species protected. And one of them was the Kororo, the little blue penguin. So they're protected as a Tonga species or a treasured species by Naipahu. Uh, and then they're also at risk decline from the Department of Conservation, which provides them protection in that way, but they're not internationally regarded as endangered. How many types of penguins have you worked with? In research, just the Korora, the little blue penguin, but then at zoos, I did a little like food preparation and habitat maintenance for Gentoo penguins and king penguins. What is your favorite type of penguin? So I think I'm supposed to be biased towards the Korora, the little blue penguin, because they're the ones I work with, and they're really adorable. They're the smallest, they're the smallest species of penguin at only one kilogram, which is like two pounds, and they're like 25 to 35 centimeters tall, which is like that. They're really, really tiny. They look like little stuffed animals, but they are vicious. Um, but I think my favorite is the Tawaki, which is the Fjordland Crested Penguin in English. They live down in the southwest of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and they're called the Marathon Penguins because this was just found out last year. They travel 7,000 kilometers, which I think is like 4,000, 5,000 miles every single year to go feed down in the sub-Antarctic. And like there's food close to the mainland. They don't have to travel that far, so we're not sure why they're doing it. It might be some remnant of continental shifts when the countries were all moving around and everything, uh, and they just liked that spot. But as Aotearoa and New Zealand move further away, then they had to travel further and further to get to it. So we're not totally sure why they do that. That's just one of the one of the hypotheses. But yeah, I really like them. They're adorable. They live in rainforests. Uh, 
cool videos right here from the Tawaki project that works to protect them, and we're still learning a lot about them. They're, they're a very newly researched species, and I really like them. So thanks for all those questions. Uh, they were really good ones, and getting back to kind of the love of penguins uh, uh, with some of the other classes we've been getting into, uh, more like the details of this one trip or whatever. But I like just you know get down to the penguins. What do they? What do they? Why are they blue? Where do they live? All the kind of things that get you interested in penguins all through your life. So thank you for those questions. I'll see you later.